All right, welcome everyone to another Media Talks at Google. My name is Stacey Chan, and I'm with the Google News team. And the team and I are so incredibly excited to have Richard Engel here in the Mountain View office. I know I see like silent claps already in the audience. That's so great. We'll, we'll say, okay, we'll do the big round of applause now. I'm so excited to have him here, oh, as, great to be here as the next speaker in our Media Talks at Google series. And we're really looking forward to hearing Richard's insights into the ever-changing media industry, um, especially as newsrooms are figuring out their own digital revolutions at their own pace, we'll say. Um, and it was really fortuitous that we got Richard here. Uh, I don't know if any of you were able to see his commencement speech at Stanford University yesterday, but he was just there. Uh, across the way, and uh, we reached out to him and said, could you actually extend your trip to the Bay Area for just a day and come speak at Google? And he graciously said yes, so we were able to get him here at the Mountain View well, campus. It's not a bad place to spend an extra day. Yeah, it you is. know where I normally live. It's, it's not as hectic. People Certainly biking not. around campus, yeah, and you no, might have to great. watch out for them, but otherwise pretty safe here, I guess. Um, as always, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so we're passing around a mic. Uh, everyone watching over the live stream, we have a Dory, go slash Richard Engel, um, spelling E-N-G-E-L. And uh, Richard, I so sort are, of explained. These are the internal questions The people who are me. online now, yes. watching internally. They're watching at their desks Hello. in different time zones. <laughs> Richard is looking forward to your questions, so ask some good ones. He's a journalist, so he's used to asking the questions to you. Now we get to turn the tables on him. Yeah. So that should be fun. Thanks a lot. Yeah. You, nothing you can't handle. I think you've been in other precarious situations, far worse than this. Um, so I'll start off with a brief bio, and then we'll just get started into questions. Um, so Richard Engel is NBC News' chief foreign correspondent. He's held that position since 2008. Uh, but Richard is a lifelong journalist. Since graduating Stanford in 1996, uh, he intrepidly decided to leave to Cairo and become a journalist in the Middle East. Uh, since then, covered wars, conflicts, disasters, revolutions for nearly 20 years. Uh, all over the world in some of the most remote countries, probably some that I have never even heard of. Uh, in 2003, he went to Iraq to cover the war. And he was the only American television correspondent to be stationed in Iraq for the entirety of the war. So pretty much the leading expert on all things Iraq and the Middle East. Um, then joined NBC News in 2003, became the Middle East correspondent then the Beirut bureau chief, and then now into his role as the chief foreign correspondent. Um, She's memorized all of this. He's a <laughs> fascinating hasn't looked, person. She hasn't it's, looked down once, by the way. It, when when just you saying. have these, this kind of experience, it's really my easy to recap. Well. <laughs> I can always be your PR person if, if Google doesn't work. If this little company doesn't work out, if it folds tomorrow, I think you'll. Uh, we can talk fun. about it, but I don't think it will. And I know someone in the audience wanted to talk about. Richard's time covering the Syrian civil war when many of us remember in December 2012 anxiously watching the news reports of his kidnapping uh, when he and his five crew members? It was, there were six of us in total, but um, you know, that, that's right. So we'll, we'll, I'll definitely ask we'll get into some it. questions we'll get into about it. that. Um, but thankfully, as you can see, he and his crew escaped and made it out alive. So very glad he's here today with us. Um, and then most recently, you've got a documentary coming out about Nepal, um, the devastating earthquake that happened uh, just last month, two months ago now, April 25th, killing 9,000 people, injuring countless others. Um, that documentary is airing, remind me again of the date? June 28th. June 28th. June 28th. And it's, it's no, it's actually, since you brought it sure, up, we can start it's, about it's uh, when we went there, we went there I think we arrived about 15 or 16 hours after the earthquake okay. had struck. And we happened to be in Istanbul, Turkey. And not many places were flying to Nepal. And there was a flight leaving from Istanbul that was originally canceled. And then the flight got taken over by Turkish aid workers. And we managed to get on that flight. So it was just us and Turkish aid workers and a few other journalists and the rescue dogs. And we got on the flight. And I wasn't sure if it was going to take off at all. And we, we got there, and it did. And it landed in Kathmandu. And the earth was still rolling with aftershocks. I mean, we got into the landing um, arrival hall, 
and an aftershock hit, and everybody clears out because we thought the building was going to come down, including the customs officials, including the customs official who had my passport. I was like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I'm at a dilemma. I was like, do I enter the country? You know, it's like, think you were, imagine you arrive at you know, JFK, and everyone leaves, and you're standing there, and they have your passport. Do you go in? So I waited till the guy came back. I was like, can I have my passport back? <laughs> so he stamped me in because I figured I'd have trouble leaving, which I would have had trouble. And uh, we stayed in, in Kathmandu and the surrounding area for the first week or so, reporting on the, the earthquake and the buildings that went down and the, the, the temples that were destroyed and the reactions people were having to that and how everyone kind of moved outside. It was a really strange phenomenon that I hadn't expected that everyone just suddenly went to live in the parks and was calm about it. There was no looting. There was no violence that I saw. People were not hostile. Um, they were incredibly kind and receptive to us. And they just were taking it as it, as it came. You know, again, like New York City, imagine everyone moves into Central Park all at once and is living there for, for a while, and there's no fighting. That would be incredible. And all the buildings are empty. And everyone's just sort of chilling out in Central Park without anyone telling them to do this. No public announcements go to Central Park. They just did it. So you don't have to worry about. And, and then, I'm almost done. <laughs> and then we went up to Mount Everest uh, base camp. And because there was an, the, the earthquake triggered a, an avalanche that devastated the central part of base camp. So, you know, there's a base camp at about uh, almost, almost 18,000 feet. 17,598 feet high, very high. high. And this base camp is where the climbers go and congregate and then attempt to make the ascent on Everest. Or sometimes trekkers will just go there and visit it. And I know Google had a terrible experience yeah. up there, and I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you. Um, so we wanted to go and see what was going on there. And we got to the Everest base camp saw the devastation there, and we're doing a, a documentary that I think, because of your terrible experience, might be a lot, very interesting to a lot of people at this company um, about what happened at every space camp told through a group of, of survivors. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that documentary airing sometime this month. 28th. The 28th. OK, we've got it on schedule. So you said that when you land in a place like Kathmandu, the ground is still rolling. Um, with such unpredictable factors like Mother Nature, how do you ensure yours and your crew's safety when you go into some of these very dangerous situations? Um, I actually don't cover that many natural disasters. This was an unusual thing. Mostly I'm, I cover man-made disasters. Which are arguably even more dangerous. Yeah, which are, I think are much more dangerous. I mean, in a natural disaster, okay, you're in a building and it, it either falls on top of you or it doesn't. That's pretty easy. And then in another natural disaster, you have to deal with the hostility of the people. Are they angry? Are they going to be looting? Is there going to be theft? That's relatively straightforward. Um, most of the time, however, in a, in a war zone, it's much more complicated because you're dealing with rebel groups. You're dealing with government troops. You're dealing with guns. You're dealing with uh, possible kidnappers. You're dealing with. Uh, possibly soldiers who are you know, rebels, who are drunk, who don't know what they're doing, who um, have a grievance against you, or have a perceived grievance because you don't know necessarily what's in their mind. Um, a friend of mine, a colleague, said the most frightening thing he ever saw in his life was pulling up to a checkpoint, I think it was in Somalia, and there was a 14-year-old a boy with a blonde wig on holding an AK-47. Because that's the person who controls whether you're going to live or die. So it's not the same as, as an earthquake. You know, you're, you're dealing with, with someone who's, you know, God only knows what brought them to that moment in time. And, and you're dealing with some of these people, like you say, who are in control of your fate. And you cover these incredibly dangerous situations, all these conflicts. What draws you to places like these? Is there something inherent about war or conflict that you say, that's just so inherently interesting. Um, I, I spoke about this uh, at the commencement yesterday, which was such an incredible honor. I'm still, uh, I'm still tingling. You know, That's my follow-up question. I was, so. I was uh, amazed and, and, and humbled to be asked and shocked. I just got an email one day and said, would you commit to this? I was like, are you serious? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
Um, I didn't actually ask if you're serious. I just said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked, uh, I was like, are they serious? But um, the re as I said yesterday, um, the reason I go to war zones is not because I, I like them. It's not because I like war. I don't like the violence. I don't like the spectacle of, of, of groups getting together and, and trying to kill each other. Um, I, I hate it. And I hate it more and more uh, as, as time goes on and the more conflicts I cover. But I go there because I think it's revealing. And think of a, you know, an atom smasher, right? You smash two things together because when they break apart, you can understand something about their components, maybe even something universal. And if you, I, I like to think of war as like a, like a collision. Um, think, you think of a car crash, right? Two cars smash into each other on, on an intersection. And in that tiny split second, it's a horrible moment, you see everything, the whole range of the human experience. You see maybe someone is dead, somebody else is alive, uh, injured, is, is the society still working? Is, is an ambulance coming? Maybe it's not coming. Who was that person? Did he have a fight, the, the dead person? Did he, was, he, was he a man? Did, did he have a fight with his wife that morning? Everything is encapsulated right there. Is someone rushing in to help? A policeman or a bystander? Is somebody else pushing, rushing away to escape? So in that tiny split second, you see the whole range of the human experience. Now, imagine a war where you have two countries or two religions or two ethnic groups smashing into each other. It's that car accident magnified by a thousand or by a million. And it's very revealing. You understand a lot about how societies work, how they don't work, what happens when people are pressed, the cowardice, the courage, the, the degree of sophistication of a society or the degree of its sort of barbarity. It's all right there. So that's why I go to war because it's revealing. And but what, it's revealing in a tragic way. Right. What, what are some of the biggest revelations you've seen uh, in covering all these different conflicts? I would say that it's, it takes courage to be good. It takes courage to be kind. It's easy to be mean. It's easy to be cynical and to take advantage of people when they're down. It's easy to, um, to exploit through misogyny or through ageism or whatever it happens to be. It's, it's easy to exploit those that a particular culture, or racist, that a particular culture has marginalized. And it takes courage and confidence to do something brave, to help someone out. And when I see it, and I see it a lot, I'm always uplifted. But unfortunately, it is those who, who take a stand to be good. And, and I unfortunately think that the, the opposite is, is, the, is the path of least resistance. So that's something that's been a little bit depressing. But I, I'm always encouraged when I see people who are brave enough to, to, to put themselves at, at, at risk uh, to take in a refugee family or to um, you know, hide uh, people, you know, like in the, you know, World War II, you know, hiding Jews in their homes and, or taking in someone from a different ethnic or religious group now in the current conflict. So uh, that's always encouraging to see. And in your role as a journalist, do you feel it's your job to be magnifying those uplifting stories or to give the actual reality of what's going on in these, in these places? Well, when I see them, I'll, I'll cover them because I'm, I'm excited by them. But like, like I was saying, unfortunately, they're not the norm. Uh, unfortunately, the norm is, is usually the path of least resistance where people are sort of cruel or negligent or just sort of selfish. Um, that's, that's unfortunate. So yes, when I see them, I, I love doing stories like that. Um, but I, I, I just kind of take stories as they come. You know, when you arrive in a place Again, to go back to that car accident, mm -hmm. and everything is smashed together and thrown up in the air. You just kind of see what you see. Um, you find someone who's got an amazing story, and maybe they're doing something wonderful. Great. Or you find somebody else, and he's doing something horrible. Okay, you talk about that, and you see a situation. You know, we were in Nepal, and uh, there was a an orphanage that we went to, and the orphanage didn't collapse, but it, the foundation cracked. So. Everyone had to move outside. And they were all living under a tarp in the about, about 100 
hundred children from, I don't think they were all like 12 and younger, you know, eight to 12 range. And they were living under this tarp and they were playing and they were making the best of it, but that they were orphans who were now homeless orphans. And some of them were living in a, a Buddhist monastery temporarily next door. So it was an interesting microcosm of, actually in this case, it was a very uplifting story because the whole community was helping these, this, the weakest members of society were now homeless orphans I mean, in Nepal. Yeah. You can imagine a, a, a more vulnerable, again, hard to imagine a more vulnerable community than that. And so I'm gonna tie what you've been talking about to the theme of your Stanford commencement speech, was, which was the intersection of technology and geopolitics. So can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, that since you're speaking to a room full of people who work for a technology company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. And I watched you know, the Arab Spring uh, movements, the revolutions, um, which I also include the Green Revolution in that kind of spectrum. So the Green Revolution in Iran, Tunisia, Egypt, where one revolution was inspiring the next. And if you think, if you go back to 1989, 1989, there was a, a series, an explosion, really, of, of political reform and with, with the, when the Iron Curtain came crumbling down. And those, in many ways, were facilitated by television. They were the television revolutions, if you probably read about them in poli sci. Clearly, it wasn't television that was the cause of the revolution. The cause of the revolution was the oppression, was the economic suffering. People in Eastern Europe who were living behind the Iron Curtain simply weren't living as well as people in Western Europe. And then on television, they could see how badly they were living, and they could see how oppressed they were. And then they could see the revolutions start. And once you were in Poland and you watch people uh, going to the streets in, in another commune, in Czechoslovakia, you said, well, why not us? And the, the revolutions inspired each other. And then you had a series of, of revolutions. I think the, the Arab Spring movements were probably the world's first internet-based revolutions, where the same, same reason, it wasn't the internet that caused the revolutions. The revolutions were because of mismanagement in Egypt, because of police brutality, because of economic uh, uh, wild disparities between rich and poor, the tension that was there. But the, the internet, especially when it became pocket-sized, became cell phone, which is much more subversive than television ever was. It allowed people to communicate, commiserate, plot, plan, and then to experience the revolution and share it and share lessons learned and pass it on. It sort of was a, a lubricant for, for revolutions and it made them faster. But the question uh, that I think one needs to, to, to consider and, and sort of ponder in this experience was, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Because all those revolutions happened very quickly and have almost in every case led to chaos and not a good result. In Egypt, you've seen a return of an authoritarian system. In Syria, there's chaos and civil war. In Libya, there's civil war and chaos. Um, Tunisia, probably the best example, but it's a very small country and not necessarily representative of the, of the wider region. So was it too fast? Was the societies ready yet? Or did this, was this lubricant too slippery and you, the revolution happened not on its own pace, but at sort of a digitally enhanced pace? So I, I think one of the most interesting things to think about going forward is this intersection between geopolitics and technology. And is it necessarily a, is a good thing? I, I think going forward, it could be, but I think going forward what it's gonna to lead to is much more volatility. And um, if you take a city like Cairo, there's 18 million people in Cairo right now. Right? It's big, hard to manage, it's poor, infrastructure is terrible, education is poor. It's naturally explosive, because you have so many people who are often unhappy living right on top of each other. And now they can all talk to each other and exchange lessons learned and commiserate and, and exchange good things and bad things. So it makes it a little bit more volatile because of that. Now what happens when there's 25 million people in Cairo and the air is hard to breathe, as it already is now, and communications technology are even more advanced? I think it could be even more volatile. And 
there will be, in my sort of just sort of postulating of, uh, the head, uh, ahead, I think you'll see sort of rapid revolutions or a tendency toward rapid revolutions and a countervailing tendency for strongmen to come in and use the same kind of technologies to hunt out and hunt down, uh, I should say, ferret out and hunt down the revolutionaries. So you'll have a tendency for quick uprisings and a tendency for strongmen to come in and squash them. That's where I think. So I think it's, I could be totally wrong. And, and I think people in, in this room and, and, and beyond uh, will have different opinions on this, and I'd love to hear them. And, 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 but the idea of where does technology, uh, as, it, as it becomes part of the more and more of a factor in, in big geopolitical issues, issues of war and peace, where does it lead us? Well, that's, I was going to follow up on I your I think it question. leads us in that, in that place, but right. we'll see. Is, is technology a good thing for spurring revolutions, inciting them? From, from a technology. If you're a dictatorship, no. <laughs> but maybe it's a good. Maybe it's good. And I'm not saying that. You know, I'm not trying to sound like someone who says, "Oh, it's it's bad. You got to keep the people down." No, absolutely not. Maybe it's maybe it will ultimately lead to a better place. The exchange of ideas, the exchange of information, the exchange of of knowledge. Maybe this volatility ultimately leads to a better place, or maybe it doesn't. Not, you know, people say, oh, there's a rough road ahead, and you have to go through this rough road to get to a better place. Well, sometimes the journey kills the patient, too. And it's, it's really, I think, unclear. And that's kind of the excitement of what I do. I don't know. I suspect that going forward, you know, I know Google was, was involved in, you know, in Egypt. And you, know, you had some Googlers, I should say, who were involved. And, and, and the, the allowing this sort of exchange of ideas was seen at the time as an enormously important political objective. And I can understand that, Tennessee. But look at what happened in Egypt. We'll see. We'll see. If it, is it a good thing long term? Yes, I think it probably is. Mm -hmm. How could exchange of ideas not be a good thing? Of course it is. But it's going to lead to a very rough road ahead or an extreme period of volatility. And I'm not sure all the countries out there are going to get through that road uh, uh, safely. Well, in addition to the exchange of information and ideas, do you have specific ideas of how different social media platforms, different technology products can help facilitate these good revolutions? Well, there's not, it's not up to me to say it's a good revolution. It's just, it's, it, I think it makes them faster. Right? Think of, OK, I describe war as a, as a car crash between two big things, nation states, religions, ethnic groups, bang together. Everything's exposed. Think of a, I think you can think of geopolitics a little bit like, like the plates of the earth. Tension builds up because of poor management, police brutality, uh, a closed political system. You have these intentions building up, building up in the system. And the more oppressive the system is, the more the tension builds. And the longer the system has been oppressing, the, low, the, the higher the tension is, like, like in the earth. And then a revolution happens and it snaps. And I think it, technology makes the snap happen faster. So the question is, is that a good? Does it, does it snap in a way that, that heals a society? Or does the snap cause the whole thing to come crashing down? The snap is going to happen. So maybe the te you shouldn't blame the technology. You should blame the, right. the, 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 the poor management of the state. But sometimes the slip happens so fast that it's not ready, and the thing comes crashing down. So before I open it up to questions in the room, this was actually a question before uh, we started. Is Richard going to discuss his time in Syria when he and his crew were kidnapped. Um, so whatever you feel comfortable with, Richard. Sure, I know no, he, has, I, he has a great, actually, first person editorial in Vanity Fair. So I'm pretty sure he's open about talking about it. But for yeah, the sure. audience, can you uh, share this experience with us? And how do you go back to covering war after experiencing such a traumatic event? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it was complicated because uh, we, we originally thought it was one group that took us. And then we later learned. Uh, that it was another group, but it doesn't change the sort of the the sort of sequence, or doesn't radically change the sort of the sequence of of, of events. So we were um, driving along in Syria about two and a half years ago, and I was with a, a team. Some of them are my closest friends, and still are my closest friends. And we get surrounded, 
by a group of gunmen. Masks, black, hooded, ski masks. And they were screaming at us. They were all dressed the, um, sort of in the same black uniforms, unofficial uniforms. They take us out of the car. And they load us into, take us out of our cars, and they load us into a container truck that's parked backwards un under the trees. And I see this container truck under the trees, and I thought, oh, no. This, we're going in there. And they'd clearly done this before, because they load us into the container truck. They slam the door shut. They have flashlights that they turn on, duct tape us up, duct tape over my mouth and nose. I thought I was going to suffocate right there. And um, they hold us for um, the next five days. And we thought we were going to die sometimes right then and there. Uh, they told us we were going to die. And uh, then after uh, the end of the five days, um, uh, on the morning of the 6th, we, we got out. And we were, went back into Turkey. And um, a rebel group escorted us back across the border into Turkey. And um, we're still reporting. And we're still very close friends. And we uh, you know, have had, you know, it's a, it's a wake up call. Because if, if it's, I think if it's almost like surviving a, like a ter some sort of terminal illness, you know, the, the flowers smell better the next day <laughs> and the food tastes better the next day. And you're like, wow, that would really could have gone badly. And it did go badly, but it could have gone much, much worse. And uh, unfortunately, the people who were kidnapped around the same time or a little bit later, I mean, we all saw what happened to them. You know, James Foley and, and other uh, journalists who were taken by ISIS and, and were, were, were really brutalized for, for a couple, several years before they were savagely butchered. So I consider myself incredibly lucky and everyone on my team to be incredibly lucky. And yeah, the, the food tastes better and the flowers smell better. I bet. Well, we're all so grateful that you made it out alive as well. I have to ask one more journalistic question. Um, you mentioned that the kidnappers were not the group, the pro-government that's what she we had a group that you had thought. That's what they were telling us, and right. that's what we thought. So when we, uh, what, what was the? Was well, the, the journalistic question was: the New York Times was planning to do this big expose sure. and, and expose who the true identity of the kidnappers were. Uh, they were planning this big scoop, and then Richard's team and the investigation team at NBC actually scooped the New York Times scoop. So, how important is it? How important was it for you to? get the story correct and out there before any other organization? Well, I just, we, um, we thought, I thought, that we knew who this group was, but we were captured, we thought, by pro-government militiamen. That's, what they, that's how they were dressing. That's how they were speaking. That's what they were telling us. Um, it seemed, seemed very credible to, to me and the other people who were on my team. I speak Arabic, and there were three Arabic speakers there, we were all of the same impression that that's who they were. They, they, they did an incredible job convincing us that they were um, government militiamen. So we got out, and that's what we thought. There were five people there. We all thought the same things. Good. Then, uh, not good, but that's, we were, that's what we thought. That's what we said. And then about just a few months ago, uh, we got this um, information from the New York Times that the people who thought us, the people who we th thought had taken us were actually hiding their identity. It may have been a different group. So of course we started looking into it. I have the most interest out of anyone in the world to find out who these people uh, are. So we started re-examining it. We did what journalists always do. You know, you look at the facts, you look it over of, of uh, the best way you could put it together. And it's a much harder to figure out two and a half years later right. what had happened because this is December 2012. Yeah, so it's, looking into it two and a half years later is obviously much harder mm -hmm. because some of the people are dead, uh, some of the other people are missing. The, um, the people you have to figure out, have they changed their story much? Who are they? What are their competing agendas? So it took us a long time to, to put it together. And after re-researching it, um, we, we, we updated the information and said, ah, you know, we've actually learned some new information. And the story was even more complicated than we thought. And it reveals how in, in Syria these days, you just, it's, it's a jungle. You don't necessarily know who's who and what the, uh, what the competing agendas are and uh, who's on whose side. 
and and how their um, uh, you know how the how this conflict has has really deteriorated into something where um, it's very hard to tell who are the who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. Well, I think that was an incredible win for journalistic integrity. So oh. we're glad that you and your team did that story. Look, we would we would do it again if somebody comes to me and says, you know, look, we have information that. Is, you know, is pertains to you. So please, I would, yeah. you know, I, I'm the most interested party in trying Absolutely. to figure it out. Definitely. Um, I know we had a couple questions from the audience. Is the mic? You somehow got away from these captors. Did they release you? Did you negotiate? Or was it some type of, they just realized that there wasn't, I, I guess, something positive they could do out of this situation? Um, again, that was complicated. Uh, initially, um, I, I think in the end, let me put it this way, I think in the end, uh, they, we became too complicated for them. I think in the end, uh, they wanted a, uh, a ransom, but it was not going well. It wasn't going as, as well as they had planned. Um, so I, I think they realized it wasn't worth it anymore. They could have either killed us or let us go. Uh, and instead, I, I think we were, they, they arranged for us to, to get out in a way that, that, that they could walk away from it um, uh, without getting themselves caught and, and to, to back off, to back off from the situation. So it was, uh, it was for them, uh, uh, for us, it was a, a kidnapping that went badly, and I think for the kidnappers, it was a kidnapping that didn't go exactly as they planned either. For a couple of years now, I've been trying to wrap my head around um, ISIS and how it came to be, because it seemed like it was such a surprise. Obviously, Obama made the famous JV comment. So I was wondering, you knowing Syria and Iraq as well as you do, was it a surprise to you? Was it some very, did you expect it, or was it just, were you caught off guard like everybody else seemed to have been? Oh, I, I, we were reporting on it, expanding. Um, Pretty consistently, because it was Al Qaeda in Iraq. It was the ISIS is Al Qaeda in Iraq. It is the same group that was Zarqawi. And if you listen to ISIS statements, they they talk about their founding members being the the, the insurgency in Iraq that was fighting in Ramadi and Fallujah and Anbar province, where they by the way are still fighting. So this happened quite gradually. U.S. forces go into Iraq in 2003. That's, that's really the start of this. It's not Syria war. It's going into Iraq in 2003. The Sunni movement there uh, is the Sunni population, some of which were regime, Saddam Hussein regime loyalists, are cornered. They see they have no future. They're antagonized. They're angry. They start to organize. They become an insurgency. That insurgency becomes more and more radical, becomes more of an Al-Qaeda-like insurgency. Then the US troop surge comes in, an enormous force with a practically limitless budget, weaponry, more weaponry than, than, you, could, than you could really imagine, is poured on to, to tamp down this insurgency. And it didn't crush it, it didn't kill it, but it tamps it down to a point where it's, it's almost meaningless. It's, it's quieted down. Then the US troops leave gives that insurgency a little bit more breathing room, but not, not much. Then the Syria, just across the border, totally collapses. So that seed of insurgency, which was always there, goes over and finds incredibly fertile ground in Syria and blossoms into ISIS. And then what happens? What is the first thing they do? They move back across the border to Iraq, to where the, which was their homeland to begin with. And now they have one group, or one ISIS caliphate, as they call it, that spans the border between Iraq and Syria. So I think when you talk about, could we see it coming? Yeah, we could see this coming. We could see it coming right from 2003. And if you, you know, there's a line that goes right back to, to the insurgency in Iraq. It's not a strictly Syria phenomenon. So you're dealing with extremely dangerous, unpredictable ISIS insurgents. Um, how do you go about endearing yourself to these people slash groups that are hostile and often brutal towards people other than their own, including other Arabs and Americans, and convincing them that they should trust you to write their story responsibly? I don't think you can anymore. Um, 
I don't think I could go to ISIS. I don't try. And, and I think those days that, that you, know, you have to know, know your limitations. Um, certain groups will not be convinced and don't want you to be there to tell their story and don't think they need to. Uh, they don't think they need us. Um, so it's not just an example of sort of being charming. You know, you can't be charming enough with ISIS. It's not going to work. You know, um, it used to be, and I, and I watched this change, and it has since, since this theme, it seems appropriate to talk about um, you know, media and technology and geopolitics and technology, um, which is what I sort of thought, you know, was what I was could have been thinking about uh, and I had coming here, uh, was in 2006, again, the Iraq war is, is raging. And that's when things like YouTube and internet videos really start becoming easy and popular. That it was, it was really simple for some people to start making their own videos and uploading them to, to YouTube. And it, co it coincided just with the peak of the, uh, or the rising peak of the, uh, the Iraq insurgency. So previously, before that, in the late 90s, uh, when I was reporting, you would, it was much more like along this example. You would go to a group, you would meet, you would chit chat. They didn't like me, I didn't necessarily like them, but we, we had to respect each other. There was a modus operandi. I couldn't, you know, you couldn't be hostile to me and beat me up or worse, because then I would say nasty things about you, and you didn't want that. So we, and I wanted access to you. So we would talk, and we would come to an agreement for my safety, and, 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 and I would hear your story, and then I would leave, and I would write the story. And inevitably, you're not going to be happy with it. You're the insurgent, by the way, in this example. Oh, OK. <laughs> you're the terrorist. I could put on a ski mask yeah. or yes, something. Exactly. You're, inevitably, you're not going to be happy with it, because we didn't tell your full story, or we took you out of context, in your opinion. Inevitably, you're not going to be happy. But you figure, OK, at least I got the message out there. Jump ahead to 2006, these groups decide, we don't need the the journalist. We'll just go direct to our audience. We'll cut them out entirely. We'll just post our, our message on YouTube. And we can say exactly what we want to say for as long as we want to say it. And you know what, journalists? It's better to kill them and, and put them in the video than it is necessarily to have to filter the message through them. So I think technology profoundly changed the way uh, that relationship uh, happens. And arguably, you talked about so you can't the be too. Of you know, it's not like you no. sit down with, with ISIS and say, "So let's," you know, no, I would, you're not going to win that one. Right. And that's interesting. You talked about technology being a force for good and, and speeding up some of these revolutions, but it sounds like you just gave an example where it could be very deadly when you have the bad guys having direct access to the people they're trying to recruit, look the people the, trying to get the to their side. Look, it's full of oh, these videos. Some of these videos are appalling. Right. Appalling. Yeah. Brutalized. It brutalizes the, the spectator. You know, you look on these videos, and, and which I look at a lot, they're, they're absolutely pornographic in their violence. And yeah, that's not a good side of technology. You, know, you, you don't want the internet to just become some you know, highway for, for bandits and criminals to use to speed up and down their messages into our, into our bedrooms and into our you know, houses, into our minds. No, that's, that's not wonderful. Right. And with all technology comes the good and the bad. So we'll Absolutely. see how that plays out. Another question? Hi, yeah. I was wondering what you think news organizations can do to better maintain the public's attention to wars and natural disasters. How to keep the story going. Why aren't we covering Nepal now, and why does it move on? I, I wish, um, I, I wish, to be honest, that we were, and we are actually. Yeah, we have a documentary coming up in a few days, but I, I do know your point. Um, generally, there's a news cycle, and it gets shorter and shorter. Sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's a week, and there seems like there's the movie of the week, and then everyone moves on. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a provider of news. I don't, set, I don't decide programming. You know, I gather. I'm still in the hunter-gatherer mode. But I think it's, yes, I think it's really important uh, to, to stay on top of stories. But how to convince news organizations, my bosses, other people's bosses, to stick on this story when there's another story happening that week, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge. 
maybe that's a, maybe that's maybe you have better ideas for that. Um, I still gather the stories, but how to break out of this cyclical story of the week phenomenon that we're in right now, sometimes story of the hour or story of the day. I think actually technology sometimes really in, is, the, is working against us on that one because people go for the trending topics and, oh, that's, this thing is trending, and they follow what's trending you know, on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever f for a minute, and, and, and media organizations are chasing that. Mm. So I, I think, if anything, um, this, you're not helping us in this way. <laughs> you're, you're making it harder to get where you want to go and where I, I think uh, I'd like to go as well. Well, could you argue that the media could be the trendsetters, and it sounds like it actually might be a battle within the newsroom to convince the programming people yes. that, no, we want to do a follow-up Nepal story. This I fight is gonna... that battle all the time. I fight that battle all the time. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. But yes, there are battles in the news group. This is This is Ben Plesser. Ben Plesser is a fabulous producer. Uh, he, he and I have worked together for some time now. We go all around the world. I. Uh, this is a, a very serious individual. I like it on this side of the camera, generally, <laughs> but, uh, or that side. But uh, just a shameless plug to answer kind of the three last questions in another way. Uh, we did an hour-long documentary on ISIS, um, which aired on MSNBC. We would never manage to get that on you know the, our larger platforms. Um, but that's our a that's our answer to where ISIS came from. There's a whole big section there where Richard walks through that in a, in a much longer way than he was able to do here. Two, that's our answer on some level to, is to find other platforms. Um, different, this is the last uh, group we need to tell, different platforms have different audiences with different kind of tolerances and we try to find them as best we can. Um, and three, I think Richard could discuss in the intersection between YouTube and what we do, the beginning of that hour with uh, uh, the challenge on the, the press not coming to Kobani. Yeah. So, uh, so as, as Ben was um, Ben was saying, uh, maybe a way that you can do it is, is what, and what we try and do is you find different platforms. So if NBC News, which is a big platform, won't run it, NBC, MSNBC will give us an hour uh, and, and and put it on there mm. and put it together. But um, there was a, a, a challenge. Um, Sort of a lot of there's a lot of user-driven um, uh, video out there, and there's a tendency I think among the people who troll, troll the internet to believe it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, um, but there is a huge tendency to the, the more obscure the source, it seems to be that the people on the street think the more credible it is. I don't know why, but they they do. Huh. So oh, that that's a, you know it's a source I've never heard of, so therefore they must be telling the truth, not the the big media organizations who are not the legacy organizations. Yes. Um, but there was, a, uh, there was a town, there still is a town in Syria called Kobani. You may have, have, have heard of it. It's right on the Turkish border. It's a Kurdish town. And ISIS, through its own media channels, was putting out, oh, we've controlled Kobani. We've taken it over. We control 90% of the town. We're victorious. They were raising flags. They were releasing videos of flags being released. And we said, OK, maybe. So we went in, and we went in, and we found it was not the case. And there was a small group of rebels holding out, fighting, and they eventually got some more American support, and they turned the tide. And this sort of nucleus of rebels that was in the town, with incredible stamina and determination, held out, then later American air support, and turned the tides and pushed all these people out. But it was, it was, ISIS was, was saying the opposite. We've taken it over. And, and by saying it, they were making a fait accompli because they were terrifying even the townspeople who were thought, OK, if things, everything's lost, we better leave. You know, it was a way to say, oh, it's all done. You know, and a lot of these refugees and a lot of people who are one of ISIS's most powerful weapons is its scare tactics through the internet. Sometimes ISIS will come to a town, and the town will already be empty. Sometimes they'll announce that they've taken a town. They haven't even taken it yet. But the people in the town say, what? This town has been taken by ISIS, and they'll run away. Wow. 
So with all that misinformation just rampant on the internet, people plagiarizing this misinformation, ripping it off, shaping it into another form, um, the follow-up question online is, uh, how do you and the NBC digital team then make sure your online audience is reading and or watching your originally reported story with all the facts? It's or hard. can you? It's hard. I mean, you have to put it out there. How do you, there's so many different ways to, you know, to get into, into people's devices. I, I, how can they, do I make sure that, that you, you get the story that is the, the right story, the story that I've worked hardest to, to that I'm not prioritize click that Click on one? that obscure source. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. I try and, I mean, I think NBC has an invested interest to try and promote the material and make sure it's easily accessible, but um, I, am, I do not own an algorithm that sorts data. <laughs> I know another company, however, that does, that, that is good hint, at finding hint, nudge, things nudge. on the internet, but Point um, taken. that's not my job. <laughs> Although I hear people do that. They do organize data and they find it and they, they sort of select groups and they try and stream data to them. You can find news, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fair point. All right, a question from the audience. Uh, thank you for coming to speak to us, Richard. Oh, absolutely. Um, so recently on a cable news channel, you characterized the president's foreign policy as convoluted and self-contradictory. And I think you gave examples of the administration supporting Iran and some of its activities in the Middle East, and then Saudi Arabia and some of its activities. So I'd be interested to hear more about um, why you uh, think that that isn't the best way to go. Well, talking about being self-contradictory, this is, we speak to a lot of analysts, and this is what a lot of analysts have been telling me, and a lot of people in the region, some political leaders in the region. And they say, if you look at, look at the policy objectively, is it consistent? And they, their answer is no, it's not consistent. So if you, if you take Syria and Iraq, for example, where they're both really proxy wars in, in many ways. They're civil wars, but also proxy wars. So in Iraq, you have the Iraqi army and the Iraqi government, which are being backed by Iran. And when those Shiite militias, which are also backed by Iran, fight in a city like Tikrit, the US is giving them support. So the US in this case, in this piece of the war, is supporting Iran. Up in the north of Iraq, there's Kurdistan. In that case, you're tr the US is more or less supporting Kurdish autonomy. We are helping, by helping the Kurds, the Kurds to establish their own state. Like it or not, a lot of people like it. Some plenty, plenty of countries do not like it. But that's what the effective result of the US policy is. So we're supporting an independent Kurdistan while telling Baghdad at the same time that the government needs to reconstitute itself and seize control of all of its territory. So if you're a Baghdad, that seems very contradictory because the Americans will come and tell you, Baghdad, you need to do more to take control of your country. And then Baghdad says, but you're establishing Kurdistan in the north of the country. That's a contradiction. The Sunnis in Anbar province which is Western Iraq. The US just recently, uh, just a few days ago in fact, decided to send 400 more, 450 more advisors to Anbar. So we're effectively more or less becoming a sponsor of the Sunnis there, okay? They are radically anti-Iran. So they're confused by the policy, which again, when the Iranian forces move up toward Tikrit, we're helping them. So the people in Anbar say, well, this doesn't make sense. This is totally convoluted. Cross the border into Syria. The US is fighting ISIS and bombing ISIS almost on a regular basis. Bashar al-Assad is also bombing ISIS on a regular basis. So when we bomb ISIS, are we helping Bashar al-Assad? In effect, yes. But we're also still backing rebels who are against Bashar al-Assad and paying and training them. Iran backs the government of Bashar al-Assad and attacks ISIS. We're negotiating with Iran at the same time on a, for a nuclear deal. So a lot of people say, what is all of this? It's, it's so self-contradictory in many ways, and it's inconsistent. And is it working? 
Um, if you look at the region right now, it doesn't necessarily appear to be working. Uh, so that's why I would say, I know it's a long answer, but that's why I would say a lot of people I speak to say that it is internally um, inconsistent. Uh, hi. So my question is more kind of about your like path to getting here. Uh, it seems like when you graduated, right, you kind of just decided to pursue this kind of calling for adventure and stuff like that, and kind of this region that seems very interesting. And I'm just wondering how you kind of were able to, I guess in a way, like there's, there's a lot of pressure, right, from I'm sure like your parents or other people, or just seeing, right, like your classmates doing other stuff. How are you able to kind of stick to your plan um, through, I'm sure, many years of just like, what am I doing? Almost right? 20. Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing the same thing for almost 20 years. Yeah, it was just kind of like a sense of like, who know, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, right? There's no clear path, but there is a kind of this ambition. So, well, I graduated from from Stanford, just down the street from here, and uh, I left immediately for Cairo, or almost immediately, because I wanted to be a journalist, and I, I, I thought the Middle East was going to allow opportunities and was going to be. The, uh, I like to use this analogy, the, the train of history. And I thought that's where the train of history was going to go through next. And I wanted to get on board, sit in the front car, and watch it happen. And, and, and I, I wanted to do that passionately. And I still want to do that. So I haven't had a lot of second guessing um, about it. You know, there's been tough days, and there have been, um, there've been bumps along the road, certainly, as we, and we've talked about some of them today. But um, I still very much enjoy, I would say, love sitting in that front car and watching what's happening outside and, and seeing history unfold. And I don't know if it's always going to be in the Middle East. Um, I've done almost 20 years now in that region, but I'm spending more time in, in Russia these days. We just got back in Nepal. I think what's happening in China is fascinating. Uh, the, the train keeps moving. And we've talked a little bit about the you know, intersection of between of technology and political change today, um, and I, I give some thoughts about where I think maybe uh, where the world is heading, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, and, and, and that's the exciting part. That's why I haven't had a lot of second guesses from my watching my friends and what they're doing, and uh, I, I've been really, uh, really enjoying the ride. And on a final note, at, when you're giving the commencement speech at Stanford, it was to an audience of relatively young, recent college graduates. But I believe you're talking to a room and a company full of people who have that similar wide-eyed approach to the world, where the sky's the limit, we're here to innovate and to change the world for the better. Good. So do you have a message for us Googlers going for it as we go back to our desks and get back to work? Well, yeah, then please do change the world for the better. I mean, and I'm not saying that you're not now, but I'm saying <laughs> that I think that's an important goal to, 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 to stick to, that um, the internet doesn't have to be just a, you know, a vehicle for crazy propaganda or porn or a way to share photos of your lunch. You know, there, there, is there a way to actually make it better, make our society better, not just more interconnected and more volatile, but actually better? Um, that would be a, an incredible mission. If you could do that, you know, I'll come work here. <laughs> <laughs> we just have a great recruitment tool for Richard Engel. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for coming. We really happy. appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much for coming today. It's great.